All right, so here's the first chapter of cha- uh, section of chapter 9, which is going to talk about the Pythagorean theorem, which is probably something you have seen in some of your previous math classes. Um, so most of chapter 9 is going to focus on right triangles. <clears throat> so what are the different properties? What are the different theorems that go along with it? How do we find missing parts? And so Pythagorean theorem is going to be a pretty big piece of this. And so for Pythagorean theorem... When we look at a right triangle, it's under, or, uh, important to understand what the different parts are. So when we look at a right triangle, when we see the right angle here, so the two pieces that make that right angle happen, so the two pieces that come together and make that right angle right there are called the legs, and then the side opposite, so if I draw an arrow straight across from the right angle, is going to be my hypotenuse. Now, as I'm looking at this, Identifying legs and hypotenuses should be fairly easy when that right angle is given. So if I have my right angle, draw an arrow straight across, there's my hypotenuse. The other two pieces then need to be legs. Now what Pythagorean theorem says is it's leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So we take whatever number they give us for the legs and square them both, add them together. Then we take the hypotenuse, square it, and we should get the same number for both sides of that equation. Now, you guys, when you've seen this before, probably didn't do the whole leg squared. Leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. You most likely learned it as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And so again, as we're looking at this right triangle, if I see the right angle in here, draw my arrow straight across, I get my hypotenuse or my c value, and then the other two pieces have to be a and b. Now, one thing to note here as well, when we're looking at a right triangle, <clears throat> the hypotenuse is always going to be the longest side. So there's going to be times where they might give us a triangle with no markings, and they tell us that we have a side of 4, 6, and 9. And they're asking us to set up a Pythagorean theorem e- equation. Well, so if I'm looking at this, there's really no right angle to go off of. And so what we have to understand is the two small sides are going to be my A and B. The biggest side, so the largest number, is going to be that hypotenuse. So when you're looking at those numbers, like if they don't give us a picture and they just give us three numbers, the two smallest are always A and B. The biggest is always C. So that hypotenuse is always the biggest side, and that's going to be something that we come back to over and over throughout the chapter. So as far as using Pythagorean theorem, we can solve for missing sides. So if we're given... Um, two sides of a right triangle and we want to find the third side, we can go ahead and set up our uh, Pythagorean theorem. So here's my right angle. I go right across. There's my hypotenuse or my C. So that means the other two pieces must be my A and B. So I can set up X squared plus 7 squared is equal to my hypotenuse 14 squared. And so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and try to solve for x. And so in my calculators, I can just take 14 squared minus 7 squared. So I just type in 14 squared and then minus 7 squared. So I'm just going to move that 7 squared over. And what I get is 147. And so when I have 147 equals x squared, I'm close, but I still need to find what x is equal to. So as far as x is concerned, I would need to square root both sides. And so when I square root, that square root cancels the square. I'm left with just x. And now for 147, if I plug that in my calculator, square root of 147 is a decimal answer. And so since we just got done talking about reducing radicals, that's going to be kind of what we're going to deal with here uh, for the first half of chapter 9 is working on reducing those radicals. So if you remember, we had those list of perfect squares. So 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, uh, 64, and so on. So if you have those list of perfect squares, you're going to want to kind of keep track of those um, as we go through these types of problems. And so with 147, I would start going through my list from top to bottom and just start dividing. As soon as I take 147 divided by one of these perfect squares, that gets me a whole number that's the number I want to use. So in this particular instance, I can find that I can get 147 broken down into 49 times 3. And so 49 is one of my perfect squares up here. <clears throat> and so I can take this 49 and bring it outside as a 7. And then the 3 has to stay where it's at inside the radical. And so I get 7 squared to 3. 
And so that would be my missing side here, seven square roots of three. On the other example, we're missing our hypotenuse. And so if we look at our right angle, we follow across, there's my hypotenuse. And so the other two pieces must be my A and B. So I'm gonna take four squared plus six squared is equal to X squared. We always add the two smallers to equal the big. And so then if I plug that in my calculator, four squared plus six squared is 52. So I get X squared is equal to 52. And so now again, I have an X squared I wanna get rid of. So I use a square root here. So the square root cancels the square, I just get X. 52 is not one of my perfect squares. So if I'm looking at my list up here, I don't have that 52 as a perfect square. So I start maybe at 49 and work my way down. I start dividing each number on my list into 52. And what ends up happening is I find that four goes into 52 13 times. So I can break it down as four times 13. And then since four is my perfect square, I can bring it out as a two. 13 is not perfect, it stays inside. And so I get that answer of two square roots of 13. Okay, so with these Pythagorean theorem problems, we're really focusing on can you set up the equation, can you solve for x, and then once we get to the radical portion, that's where we're going to kind of work on reducing radicals just for more practice from the lesson that we talked about um, a couple days ago. Okay, now Pythagorean triples are um, a set of three numbers that satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. So basically, if I were to set up my a squared plus b squared equals c squared, these would be three numbers that always work for any triangle. So the most common ones are probably 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, and then probably the 8, 15, 17. And then they also throw another one, 7, 24, 25. Now, not only are those Pythagorean triples, but they also have multiples. So if I take all of these numbers right here and multiply them by 2, then I get a second set of triples, 6, 8, and 10, would satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. Now, these are not going to be required to be memorized. Like, I'm not going to ask you to memorize these. They're just there for shortcuts. If you notice a triangle that has these triples used or has, like, two of the figures, so like, if I have a triangle like this and they tell me that I'm looking for X, this side is 12, this side is 13. Well, if I have these triples memorized, 5, 12, and 13 always go together. So if I have my 12 and 13 already, X must be 5. There's really no work involved. So these triples are just shortcuts you can use. So if you want to take a look at those and use those um, as shortcuts, you can definitely do that. Otherwise, you can always use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the missing side that you, you don't have. Now, the Pythagorean theorem says that if I set up a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I can use that to solve for a missing piece. I can also use that to determine if I have a right triangle to begin with. So if I look at these two examples down here, notice there's no right angle marked. They want to know, well, what is, uh, it, what type of triangle is this? Is it a right triangle or not? And so when I'm looking at the picture, one of the first things I have to understand is, which are my two smallest sides? Because those are going to be my A and B, and the biggest side is going to be C. So if they give me a, a picture like this first one right here, <clears throat> where they give me a radical, this square root of 113, some of you might be able to look at that and at least estimate about what it should be, but if not, just plug it in your calculator. So if I take the square root of 113, so if I take the square root of 113, I would get a 10.6. So this is about 10.6. Now we're not gonna use that decimal, but that just kind of tells us how the three sides relate. So this is definitely my biggest side. That means seven and eight would be my A and B. And so from here, I can set up seven squared plus eight squared is equal to the square root of 113 squared. And so on the left side, I just plug that in my calculator. Seven squared plus eight squared is 113. And on the other side, if I have a square root being squared, those cancel, and so I just get 113. And so notice the left and right side came out to be the exact same number, so this would be a right triangle. Now, if I look at the second example, okay, I'm looking at my three sides, and again, I need to identify the, the biggest side. And so in this case, um, I might need to plug this in my calculator, the four squared of 95. So if I take four, 
times the square root of 95. That gives me about 38.98. And that means out of the three sides, this would definitely be my biggest. So that means 15 and 36 are gonna be my A and B. So I take 15 squared plus 36 squared and set that equal to, and here I'm gonna do something because when you go to your calculator, this is kind of a tricky one to plug in. I'm gonna put the whole thing in parentheses. When I have that double term with an outside and inside term with my radical, I need to put those in parentheses in my calculator. And so on the left side, it's pretty straightforward. 15 squared plus 36 squared gives me 1,521. On the right side, if I'm gonna plug this in my calculator, I need to put parentheses. So I need a parentheses, then four times the square root of 95, and then close the parentheses, and then hit the square key, and then when we get the answer, it comes out to be 1,520. So now notice the left and the right side are not the same, and so this would not be a right triangle. So one of the types of questions they're gonna ask you is, in the triangle, is it a right triangle or not? Now we're gonna go even a little bit further than that. We're gonna say, okay, if it's not a right triangle, what kind is it? And so that's where this next piece is gonna come into play. And so we have these Pythagorean inequalities theorems. So it's basically saying if I set up my a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and the sides are not equal, then what type of triangle is it? So if it's not right, then it would have to be acute or obtuse. Now you can definitely look at these theorems and you can memorize them and know the situation for which is acute and which is obtuse, but here's the way I typically think of it. If I were to look at my triangle, I kind of always assume at the start that it's a right triangle. So I kind of draw it like it's a right triangle. And then basically as I'm looking at this for my A, B, and C. So if this is my right triangle, then what that means is when I take a squared plus b squared equals c squared, this equation will be true, meaning c fits perfectly right where it's supposed to fit right here. So c fits perfectly for that right triangle. Now, if a squared plus b squared is not equal to c squared, so if those two sides are not the same, then as far as acute versus obtuse, I just think about c. So for c, it fits perfectly for a right triangle. <clears throat> but if C is too long, for instance, so if C were to actually come all the way out to here, then that means A would actually have to open up wider to get out to where C ends, meaning we'd have an angle bigger than that 90 degrees that we started with. So then I know, based on that, that it's going to be an obtuse triangle because I had to have a bigger angle to get out to where C was. Now, if I were to look at C and it's too small, so maybe C only comes out to here where I have highlighted in green. Well, so if C is there, that means my A value would have to come into here, so it'd have to make a smaller angle than the 90 degree, and that's gonna make it acute. So as we're looking at these triangles here, that's typically how I kind of try, er, remember these theorems. I try to set up the a squared plus b squared equals c squared. If it's perfect, we're right triangles. If c is too big, it's an obtuse triangle, and if c is too small, it's an acute triangle. And so the types of questions you're gonna see, they're gonna give you some, uh, some measurements, and they're gonna ask you what type of triangle is it? Is it right, acute, or obtuse? And so again, when you're working with these, uh, if they don't tell you A, B, and C, like in this case, we're telling you what A, B, and C are, you have to understand the two smallest sides are going to be your A and B. The biggest side is going to be your C. So for this first setting right here, I would set up my A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Oops, I'm going to put 26 in there. And so if I plug those in my calculator, 10 squared plus 24 squared gives me 576. And 26 squared gives me 676. So if I'm looking at these, uh, this equation here, I know that this does not hold. So it's definitely not a right triangle. So look at C. C was much bigger than A and B were. And so if C is bigger, that makes this an obtuse triangle. 
when I look at the second example, I have my A, B, and C, so I set up five squared plus eight squared is equal to 10 squared. When I plug in five squared plus eight squared, I get 89. And on the right side, I get 10 squared, which is 100. And so again, I look at C. These are definitely not the same. So C is bigger than A and B. We have another obtuse triangle. When I look at the last one here, if I set up my A, B, and C, so 14 squared plus 10 squared equals 15 squared. This time when I plug in 14 squared plus 10 squared, I get 296. And 15 squared is 225. And so when I look at C, I know it's not equal to the A and B. And in this case, it's too small. So it didn't reach out far enough, which means this is going to be an acute triangle. So when you get to these types of questions, you're really just going to be looking at <clears throat> how does A, B, and C relate. So I set up my Pythagorean theorem. If the left and right side are identical, it's a right triangle. If they're not identical, then I just look, is C too big or too small? So C is too big, means we open wide, and that's an obtuse triangle. If C is too small, we don't open as wide, and it becomes acute. So with all of that, you should be able to complete the worksheet from today, so you can get that in class or off of Google Classroom. Make sure to ask questions if you have any. Uh, you can email, ask in class, or even check the answer key as that becomes uh, available to you. So you're going to work on that, um, get you some practice on these, and then we'll kind of work on from there.